Good morning and thank you for joining us for our program on this Lord's Day morning. I hope that you're doing well and we invite you to join us in services today at the Pavern Street Church of Christ. We will gather for Bible study this morning at 9 o'clock and we'll have classes available for all ages. Following our Bible class period, we'll enter into the worship hour at 9.50. We also gather on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock for our evening worship service and then again on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock for midweek Bible study. And on Wednesday nights as well, we have classes available for all ages. We would love for you to come and be our guest at any or all of these upcoming services. For our program this morning, I would like to begin by calling your attention to a passage from Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Here the Apostle Paul writes, To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory." Whenever we look at these concluding verses of Ephesians chapter 3, we notice some doctrinal or philosophical foundations that permeate this epistle from the Apostle Paul. But essentially what we see in this passage is a description of who we are in Christ. The first section of Ephesians deals with the why for the practical principles that Paul will address in the last three chapters. Why should we walk in unity? Why should we put off the old man and put on the new man? Why should husbands love their wives and wives submit to their husbands? It's because of who we are becoming in Christ Jesus. It's because we, as the church, are to make known the manifold wisdom of God, even to principalities and powers in the heavenly places. It is because we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. Well, beginning, Paul describes himself as less than the least of all the saints. And he refers to himself this way because his former life in persecuting the church is one that continued to be in the forefront of his mind. And although his sins had been completely forgiven, there were still lessons to be learned from the mistakes that he made. Being wrong, making mistakes, should lead us to humility. Paul, in writing to the church at Philippi, he said, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me? These I have counted loss for Christ, Philippians 3, verses 3 through 7. Friends, it is so tempting to have confidence in the flesh. The world's standards are contrary to our spiritual worship to God, and yet we find it very difficult to resist the great pressure to conform to the world. The world exults in a big house, a flashy car, a big salary, and all the pride and prejudice that go along with these things. But Jesus taught, let him who is the greatest among you be the servant of all. Now friends, that's a hard lesson to learn and an even harder lesson to apply. 
But Paul catalogs all his reasons to have gloried in the flesh in his worldly possessions and position. But he then goes on to say that he was willing to give it up. That he counted it all loss in order to gain Christ. Paul found that pearl of great price and he sold everything else that he had in order to obtain it. Now if Paul had remained in his former position and power, he may have been able to use his influence to give people favor in the eyes of the established powers. He might have been able to give those who sought it power, possession, and even wealth. But all of this was worthless compared to what Paul was now able to give to people, that being the unsearchable riches of Christ, the salvation of the soul, eternal life. But who are the ones that are to see the fellowship of the mystery? Well, we know that the mystery is the fact that Jew and Gentile are now reconciled to God in one body, that being the church. Therefore, this which had been hidden in God from the beginning of the ages is now made known how? It's made known by the church. The church embodies God's manifold wisdom. But what is meant by the principalities and powers in the heavenly places? Well, Brother Burton Kaufman offers in his commentary what I believe is an excellent explanation of this passage. He says the fact of the gospel's promulgation upon earth being in some manner for the purpose of making known to principalities and powers in the heavenly places God's manifold wisdom has not been satisfactorily explained. At least this student of the scriptures has not seen any satisfactory explanation of it. We shall take a look at some of the teachings people have allegedly found in this verse. John Locke said that the governments and powers in the heavenly places are the Jewish religious leaders. McKnight said they are the different orders of the angels in heaven. Calvin, Hodge, uh, Groscheid, and Linsky all thought that this refers to the good angels in heaven. Robertson understood the reference as to evil powers or fallen angels exclusively. So you see, there's such a variety of opinions And this suggests that the true interpretation might lie in a different direction altogether. In Ephesians 3 and verse 9, as we've already noted, Paul gave the purpose of gospel preaching to be that of making all men see. Ephesians 3.10 could be nothing more than a dramatic rhetorical burst of eloquent hyperbole having much the same meaning as if he had written, We shall shout the gospel message to the highest heavens and extol the glory of the church as the demonstration of God's manifold wisdom to the highest beings in the universe. Well, this view has one thing in common with those already cited. It may be wrong, but at least it makes as much sense as anything else at hand on the subject. Certainly, The whole subject of the impact of the gospel of Christ upon creations above and beyond our own human creation, of which really there is so little known and concerning which God has not given us very much information, lies totally beyond the exploration projected for this this series of thought. And so I think Brother Kaufman here has presented us a pretty good view of the differing ideas as to what this passage is referring to. But essentially what we see is that the whole plan of God from the beginning in sending Jesus into the world to be crucified and then to rise from the dead results in the establishment of his church. The church which Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against. Now, no doubt what Jesus meant was that even his death would not thwart the establishment of his church in the world. Now, there are some who believe that the church is just a substitute, that God had to provide some type of alternative plan because he was not able to establish the kingdom during Christ's first coming into the world. But we need to understand that the church, the kingdom, the family of God, the dwelling place, or the building of God, and the body of Christ are all one and the same thing. 
They are the same group of people, the redeemed, and they include both Jew and Gentile. And it's through this body, the church, that the manifold wisdom of God is made known. But what is the meaning of manifold in this passage? Well, if we look at Strong's Concordance, it tells us that the word manifold means much in number or many, or it could also mean many diverse manifestations. Now, with this in mind, we see that the manifold wisdom of God is that which can be seen in many different things. We see it in creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. We see it in his word. We see it in the lives of faithful men and women. As Proverbs 9 and verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. In this passage, God's manifold wisdom is made known by the church to all, even principalities and powers in the heavenly places. But Paul then goes on to remind us that God's eternal purpose is being accomplished in Christ Jesus. Our faith in Christ gives us boldness and access and confidence. And since all these things are so, Paul encourages the Ephesians not to lose heart at his tribulations. Again, Paul says this is his glory to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and to suffer for the sake of God's eternal purpose in the church. We see what high esteem that Paul has for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and can we afford to hold the church in any less esteem than that? Paul writes in Ephesians 3 verses 14 through 21, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, as Paul had begun to finish this prayer back in Ephesians 1 and verse 1, he interrupted it to talk to them about the great mystery of the gospel and the church's role in making known God's plan of redemption. He now turns back to, uh, turns back to this prayer, and he does this with the words, for this reason. The reason is all that Paul had been talking about, the middle wall of partition being broken down and now both Jew and Gentile were being built together upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Well, Paul bows before God from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. This includes Jew and Gentile and even angels. And in Christ, both the earthly and heavenly realms are made one. Now, we may not be together physically, but we are one spiritually, and this is true even of believers here on earth who live in different parts of the world. And his prayer is that all believers may be strengthened in the inner man. And the psalmist exhorts us to wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord, Psalm 27 and verse 14. Paul admonishes Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. Brother Kaufman adds, said, The Lord operates through his spirit that indwells us, and by faith Christ dwells in our heart. Christ dwelling in Christian hearts is one and the same thing as the spirits dwelling in them. The first fruit of the Spirit is love, Galatians 5 and verse 23. And here, the great result of the indwelling of Christ is that of the Christians being rooted and grounded in love. But what does the width and length and depth, depth and height refer to? Well, many people believe that it refers to truth. Brother David Lipscomb believed that it was the love of Christ. Commentator Adam Clark considered it to be the church of God. McKnight saw in this a comparison of the church with the dimensions of the temple of Diana. 
Well, many of the early church fathers referred to these words as uh, referring to the cross. But from this, I would like to encourage you to think about these things and join us for our program tomorrow as we take a look at these final words from the book of Ephesians. We look at this prayer for the Ephesians as set forth by the Apostle Paul. And friends, as always, we want to thank you for joining us for our program today, for studying God's Word with us, and we pray that God blesses you with a wonderful Lord's Day.